Okay, we're all comfortable. Great. <laughs> Wait until you hear what I have to say. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, all right, so uh, thank you for coming. Uh, first, part of me wants to apologize for the title. But also, you all came, so it worked. So maybe not. Uh, my backup title was something like that, which is super plain and boring. Uh, if you have any better ID, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm feel free. But um, there's a story behind this. Uh, you know, sometimes I make stupid jokes on Twitter uh, and people like them. And this time 60 people liked it and I took that as a challenge. So I said, oh, lol, stop saying that or I'm going to make the, the, the next actually submit it. And then I got other likes, so I submitted it. And, and here we are. So the lesson is don't like my tweets because <laughs> then I, I take that as a challenge. All right, so um, let's talk about the STL. Uh, who is familiar with the STL here? <laughs> ah, cool, you're my audience. I mean, you never know, right? Uh, so the STL, Standard Template Library, uh, it's a very nice piece of software. Uh, that was proposed in 93 uh, by uh, Alex Stepanov, uh, at the time where uh, the committee and C++ language in general was really looking for something, for a solution to the uh, container and uh, algorithm problem. They didn't like what they had, or they didn't like whatever they saw around. Uh, clearly didn't want to go the way Java went, for example, or stuff like that. And then, um, kind of out of nowhere, uh, Alex started talking to some people who uh, invited him to the committee. And so, like, a couple months later, he made a proposal. And the next year, it was adopted and voted. Things were very fast at the time. We could, we could propose something like the STL and adopt it in less than a year. I, I don't know what they did. Like, it was miraculous. I guess everything was faster at the time. Was it though? Uh, we'll see. Anyway, uh, the concept of the STL is that it offers a set of uh, <coughs> sorry, a set of generic containers and algorithm uh, for C++. Uh, for those who are younger than me or uh, young enough and not remember exactly what 1994 looked like, here is some um, samples of what I remember from 1995. Uh, for uh, great year, I was 10 years old. Uh, great movies this year, top mu top music, great shows, e everything. Well, almost everything. Uh, so yeah, as, as as the picture tells, it's kind of ancient, right? Like 25 years from today, if I, if my math is roughly correct. Uh, we have grown a lot since then. So in uh, early 2000, some uh, uh, Scott published his, his book Effective STL, which is. Uh, I mean, one of the big book and telling you how to get your code like better with STL. And then uh, a couple years ago, uh, Jonathan uh, started uh, fiddling with maps. Uh, and uh, I mean, <laughs> you see why I ended up working for Paradox. So obviously I, I told him like, yeah, s sell it. People are gonna want that. And it's, it's a great map. We have a map of the, uh, of the STL. So it's clearly not uncharted territory. We literally have a map. And yet, <sighs> You join the game industry or you start talking to the game industry and you start hearing stuff like we don't use the STL here. And I have to say that that confused the hell out of me. I was like, what? We, we literally have a map of it. Like, how can, you, how can you feel lost? Maybe you should have a sign like you are here. I don't know. Uh, so hi, I'm Matthew, uh, or Mathieu, if uh, you prefer French. Uh, as my accent, I've probably told you I am not Swedish. Um, I'm a C++ developer at Paradox Development Studio. I make a great game called Europa Universalis. We call it Grand Strategy. Uh, I don't know we exactly come up with the idea at the time when we were looking for, uh, for a niche and then we've been number one because we are the only one there. That's great. Uh, but actually I would more like call them uh, interactive simulation. Interactive geo geopolitical simulation maybe. Well, basically we simulate the world uh, like in terms of uh, political and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and over influences. And then you can interact with it or not. You can just sit there and watch the AI play it, all other actors in the world, or you can try to do stuff. But the big idea is that it's supposed to be real time unless you hit the pause button. And so uh, it's basically not known for its great graphics, and it's mostly dependent on CPU time to be able to run uh, fast enough. Uh, saying that just to explain why I'm, uh, I'm talking about programming and, and, and containers, because that, that's, that's one of the big things. So, uh, in this talk, we'll talk about the STL or maybe try to make a case against the STL because, I mean, there's a lot of complaints in the video game industry against, against, uh, against the STL. So surely there is something that is true there. Like, uh, there's, uh, we, we usually say there is, no, there is no smoke without fire. So there must be something. Let's try to figure out why and what. Uh, then we will see a, a couple containers in practice to, to illustrate. 
Uh, I had much more planned initially, and then I realized I had to cut all out of slides because else I would never finish. Um, since we're taking containers and algorithm, one of the big thing uh, people usually may mention is why they don't like the containers in the STL, and so what uh, alternative you could think about uh, that we use, for example, in the building industry and in other industries. And of course, that being me and my talk, of course, I have to talk about build somehow because they refused my actual talk about build at CppCon. So ha, you get build anyway. Right, so first question, I mean, it's kind of a loaded question, but is DLCL so bad? Because you hear common complaints here and there about the STL. You might hear that it's unfamiliar, like iterators and all that stuff. That's arguably unfamiliar. Uh, one of the big arguments I always hear is like, oh, it's badly or not at all supported on my platform, so I can't really use it. Uh, it's bloated. That's that's something we usually uh, hear, and of course, performance is not that great. So let's let's try to delve into that a bit. Let's start with the the familiarity. So, first of all, as I was saying first, it's 25 years old, and we literally have a map of it. So I kind of have a hard time understanding at first when someone comes to me and say I'm not familiar with it, but. I mean, especially if you start looking at popular libraries like Boost, Appcel, Intel, like they all follow the same patterns. You will have iterators, you will have containers, you will have algorithm. Like everything, uh, everything uh, Stepanov has been ever talking about, and every uh, resources we have that teach about. Like there's a lot of uh, of, uh, of, of of things around it. Uh, and I mean, again, uh, the approach that he took is sound, right? It's uh, I think it's a staple of uh, of, of of generic programming. Uh, back in the 90s, we got some even more uh, ideas with, uh, with the works of, uh, of Alexandrescu, for example, and other people. But it's a, it's a staple of how you make, uh, of you decouple containers and algorithm without having to uh, m mingle all the, uh, all the, um, uh, all, all the, the product of all the, the solutions. Uh, but there is a point that we might still need uh, to study and teach it better in schools. Because... I don't know about you guys, but the only things I saw in uh, in school when I was related to learning C++ was basically how to do Java with C. Uh, so I understand the case, uh, especially video game industry, which on average is younger by age than most other industries, uh, even programming industries. It, it's a younger profession, so obviously more junior people. And yeah, uh, also a lot of people that are self-taught or have just learned how to make video games by themselves. They're, there's a mix and match, but the short story is schools are still not that great at teaching modern C++ and STL and stuff like that. So I can understand why people are like, yeah, if you just come out of fresh out, fresh out of school and maybe you, you saw a bunch of stuff on the internet and maybe you didn't come across the right things, uh, you might actually not know about this. And I think this is something we should do better. And this is why SD20 is so important, in my opinion, the, the study group about education, because there is still some work to be done there. Uh, <clears throat> when we go for availability, uh, I can reassure you, major vendors, uh, which usually I mean by that Microsoft, uh, GCC, Clang, they will all have a reasonably good implementation of DSTL. Uh, Microsoft used to have issues. I had to, uh, to deal with uh, some of them in my career. I'm probably not the only one. Who, who else here is stuck with 2013 or, or earlier? Only? Wow. I'm sorry. Uh, I, 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 I'm used to more people stuck with, uh, with 2030, but it's great because if you have 2015, you're almost out of the woods, and if you start going 17 and 19, you're definitely fine. Um, but it's a software, right? And as any software, it might have bugs. It might have caveats. And it might be that the release you're stuck with has bugs of caveats, and for some reason, you cannot upgrade. And I think especially in the video game industry, that's, that, that, is, that is true, right? Because, uh, for example, consoles have a very set, uh, strict set of uh, compilers they can use. Uh, and don't even start me with people who actually want to release a game for a console that is not in production yet. Because you get the SDK as we are making the console. Uh, you can probably be assured that the STL may not be of the highest quality. So there is historically a lot of baggage in the video game industry against that because either for a long time uh, the, the compiler of choice, which was MSBC, was not so great at doing STL stuff. Uh, and, and now you have consoles SDK, we, uh, which are getting better. Uh, I mean, most of them use Clang these days, except the one on Xbox because it's Microsoft, so it's MSBC. But used to be that it was not that great. So again, lots of baggage. Uh, 
my recommendation and, and retort there would just be like keep up with update, right? And as any software, if you don't report bugs, well, you can't really complain they're not fixed. I mean, we all have users, right? And I mean, I don't know about you, but I have users in video games that have a lot of opinions. But they have opinions, but they don't make bug reports. And then they have the same opinion again. Why wasn't this fixed? Maybe make a bug report. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, a bit more about talking uh, with, uh, with your actual vendors in, the, in later. But uh, there's also a bigger uh, and a larger problem. If you have a vendor that is not capable of giving you a good STL implementation, chances are the compiler that goes with it is also bad. And I can speak from experience, I had to work with Solaris. And if any of you had to work with Solaris C++ compiler, you know what I'm talking about. Like uh, literally using uh, STL ports was considered a better suggestion uh, than the actual uh, STL they provided. And for those who don't know STL port, it's a remake of the original SDI implementation of the STL. It the development stopped in 2005. In 2017 when I, uh, or 18 when I last, uh, left, uh, left my previous job, we were still using STL port. This is, this is the quality of compilers you can have sometimes. And uh, when you start doing C++ there, you realize why the RSTL is bad. It's because their C++ support in general is bad. So basically, it's telling you something. If you cannot have a good STL implementation, you're probably going to have other problems. Like 90% of the case, your template code would break somewhere, for example. Uh, as I was saying. Oh, and don't get me started about optimization. Usually, they also have... Uh, when it comes to inlining and having a good front end that can do all the magic folding stuff that, uh, that we just uh, saw in the previous talk. Uh, I, I would be curious to see what Sun CC does with that, but it's probably not going to be pretty. Crash. Well, it could crash, it could ice, um, it, it could do a lot of bad things. Uh, so yeah, actually consider open source alternatives. Uh, I bench GCC on Spark, which is the, the, which is the CPU that they make with the compiler they make with the OS they made. And the open source operating uh, alternative for a processor that they don't really want to support was, be was better. So yeah, if you really stuck with a, a vendor, well, if, if you can't keep up, like, I mean, don't use a bad product if you don't have to, right? The bloat, the bloat is another problem, right? Uh, there's a lot of features in the standard, and every time a new standard comes up, it's 200 more pages or something like that. Uh, maybe I think 17 was actually an effort to try to cut uh, the number of pages, but we will back up again. Uh, Range STS added like, I don't know, 100, 700 pages even? I'm not even sure, but clearly lots of pages. So it's easy for anyone to feel like there's unnecessary or unwanted additions. And that there have been some talk about that recently uh, and in the past year. Uh, and then when you look at vendor implementation, sometimes they kind of look complicated what they are trying to achieve. Why is there three template classes where before I reach my iterator, which is just a pointer to the first element? Why, 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 why does it have to be that complicated? Do we really need that? Um, yes and no. And that's the big thing, right? Uh, C++, like the STL, is supposed to be general purpose. It has to uh, appeal to the 99%. Uh, so, of course, uh, we, are tr uh, we are trying to follow the zero overhead principle that says don't pay for what you do not use. But it has limits, right? At some point, you have to say this container offers these guarantees, and since it offers these guarantees, for example, I'm, I'm taking containers because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about it, or this algorithm or whatever, this, this thing offers those guarantees. If we have to provide them, there is a cost associated with it. And, of course, if you come and say, but I don't need those guarantees, why am I paying for them? It's to some extent we can do something about it. This is why we have allocators, for example. This is why we have uh, a lot of templates. But there is a limit to what we can do, right? We, you cannot just have every container in the in the STL have ten policies for arguments, so that you can fine tune. Do I want exception support? Do I want checked iterators? Do I want uh, a custom allocator? Uh, am I okay with uh, with the fact that references are invalidated on a move? Like. There is a, at some point the committee has to draw a line, and the line is if someone gets into C++ or has a reasonable uh, background in programming and start programming, he shouldn't just shoot himself in the foot because we invalidated references and he did not expect it to do that. It's a trade-off, right? Uh, we the, the line has to be drawn somewhere. There are usually interminable discussions in the committee on where uh, a, a specific constraint should be there or not because it will have impacts. And usually, as long as it's not insane, uh, it 
whatever is kept as good reasons for that. We, we're going to see some examples later. Uh, of course, as I, I, I was explaining the, for the check iterators, for example, which is a common case of recrimination, uh, that's extra debug features that are supposed to help developers, but also since it's extra code, it has an extra cost. Here we come again, my favorite topic. There is a build flag somewhere to turn them off. Uh, we all know about, for example, the, 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 the MSVC flag that disabled the check iterators. That's the first way to not pay for it. The second way is to enable inlining, and usually most of that vanishes, even if the checks are still there. Uh, and that's the most important thing, and that's usually uh, a false equivalence. Debug doesn't mean no optimization. It doesn't have to. Debugs usually mean I want to debug this. Doesn't mean it doesn't have to be optimized at all. Usually, sure, you don't want all optimized because if everything is in line and vectorized and whatever, you can't find any variable, that's a problem. But most compilers have some degrees of control over that. And there is a trade-off to be had, and there is like uh, a couple axes with which you can play. You can en enable inlining or not, you can have check iterators or not, uh, you can uh, use the, run the debug runtime or not. There is a bunch of stuff you can do. It's not all or nothing. There's not like a huge toggle that says, oh, no performance and debugging, or all the performance and nothing. Like, there is a wide array there. And this is, again, uh, thanks for uh, coming to my build talk that is not there. Uh, there is a lot of things you can do. And there is, I think, more attention should be, pu should be put on uh, looking at your build profiles. Because, yeah, sure, the, 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 the default that, uh, that CMake will generate for you are insane. Uh, and the default that most people have are insane because they don't want to look at CMake, and I understand why. But you have to, sadly. Uh, and of course, all of that leads to performance, because when we say debug performance, we mean performance. Because again, uh, you do video game, right? It runs in a time box. I cannot just learn, l let my test case run. Like, if it's, you're doing a batch, right? I used to work in finance. Like, you have a system that just processes orders. Ah, OK, it, it will take an hour to process all the orders or, uh, instead of 10 minutes. Sure, it's long, but I can just run it overnight and it's fine. Or I can just ah, wait a bit. Like, it's not great, but it's doable. When you're doing a video game, like, I have to render a frame every X uh, milliseconds. If I don't do that, the screen just freezes. That doesn't work. Like, I, I have to have a result. I have to have ended up my computation after an amount of time. I can drop a few frames. I can. I mean, but at some point, it starts looking like a, a slideshow, and that's literally unusable for people. I uh, think that games usually are very complex. They have a lot of uh, things to test, and most of the test is done through actually playing the game. There is no way around it, or little way around it most of, the, most of the time. So it has to be able to run in some kind of debug mode while still keeping a frame rate that is not completely ridiculous. You're not going to have like 100 FPS or whatever, but you need to have at least, I don't know, 20, 30, something. Uh, of course, we care a lot about worst case scenarios because uh, average is good, but you also don't want to be hurt by a spike that just immediately freezes the screen for two, uh, for, for a minute. Like, it's acceptable to have a, like, in some degrees, you can have a server that just s takes forever to render a page for one user and then it's just going to refresh and it's going to be fine. When you're doing video games, y you don't really want to have, like, people playing and then suddenly <laughs> the thing just freezes because there is a, I don't know, like an allocation, for example, that had to uh, to go to the swap or whatever else. You, you you care a lot about the worst case scenario and you want to avoid it. So here is a common wisdom we usually associate with that uh, and that I hear a lot. You want better control. And to have better control, you go to lower level. Usually we, we, we mean C because assembly is starting to be a bit dodgy, right? But you're like, if it's lower level, if there is no abstraction, I can reason about what the CPU is actually doing behind the scenes. And so uh, common wisdom says, this is, should be my go-to option, because then I'm sure I'm not going to uh, end up with crazy abstraction that eat up all the CPU uh, at, at runtime if I don't optimize. But there's a caveat. Oh, uh, sorry. I, I forgot to, no. Did I, did I miss up my, uh... no, OK, sorry. Uh, I, I got confused by my slides. I was ahead of what I was saying. Uh, so yeah, I was, I was saying, the STL comes with some degrees of abstraction. You have templates, you have iterators, and then you have the debug version of all of that. And then sometimes some abstraction also have proxy iterators in the middle. And don't get me started with all the code that uh, Bjorn just showed us. Uh, <laughs> I think we make a good pair with those two talks. Uh, so you need a good optimizer to yield performance. That's, that's the idea. Uh, 
so uh, if we start, for example, to, to do, uh, it's, it's been like, what, 40 style without code, it's, it's really time. Um, so let's do, let's do a benchmark, right? Uh, we do a row, accumulate, old style, well, there is an O2 or two, but just don't mind it. I assume it's C. Uh, so you just take a, you, you take a bunch of values. It's a, it's a run, it's a Mercer twister hidden somewhere. Um, and then you just uh, take a pointer to the first element. You take the size and then you do a, dr uh, a dump for uh, from I to size uh, sum that thing. And then you, you get a checksum at the end and you tell the, uh, you tend the benchmark to not drop that value because it, the compiler might be smart enough to realize you don't need any of this and just keep everything. So you just say, no, 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 no sh I will totally need that sum, trust me. Just, just keep, it, keep it. Okay, then we do the same thing with C++, which as you can see is a bit more expressive. As in, uh, it's only one line and it just says I am accumulating something from, from A to B. And then we bench it. But since we're looking for performance and we're afraid that debug performance is going to be a problem, we're going to bench it in debug. I know, I was told that when I was in school, never bench something in debug. It doesn't make any sense. But actually, I mean, I care about it. I want to be able to debug it and I still want to have some modicum of performance. So how bad is it going to be? Anyone wants to uh, make a guess? Faster, slower, how much? Same. Same. Hmm, that's cute. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Absolutely not. Almost five times slower with Clang Lib C++. If I switch to uh, Lib C++, uh, only four times slower. So yeah, it's still four times slower. It's possibly acceptable uh, if you're doing like on average, I mean, th and this is a very simple case, right? If, if all my game was depending on just that and I had 100 FPS, and I can just divide it everything by four, have 25, I would be fine. But in practice, that's not the case, right? I'm gonna have much more complicated things. But four times slower is kind of big deal, especially because it's not four times slower compared to release. It's four times slower compared to, 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 to C++, to, to, uh, between C and C++. So that's, that's an issue. If all my game was made in C, it would be four times faster. I, I mean, if we trust one benchmark and extrapolate in everything, which is wrong, don't do that. But let, let's go for the, cre cre like for, the, for the full case. If I made all my stuff in C, I would be four times faster when I debug it. And that's a huge deal. Except, um, yeah, so this guy comes and he's like, yeah, that's why I don't use, that's why you see C++ has bad performance with optimization. Um, this is kind of a made up quote from various feedback I could have seen in my Twitter feed over the past year. All right, so that sounds like true, but let's, let's think about it. Let's go back to 1994. Everybody, someone recognize this? Come on. Yeah, it's a 486. It's a great, oh, it's the latest 486 we ever made, the DX4. It had 100 megahertz, 100 megahertz. I had a DX266, I was jealous. Um, didn't mean much at the time, but uh, but yeah, yeah, it's it's a DX4. It's the last. Uh, you know what's Do you know what's uh, where I'm going there? Or maybe do you just know what's what's so special about the 486 compared to, for example, the Pentium? You have seen my talk or what? Yes, the 486 is the last x86 CPU to run uh, instruction sequentially. This is the last time when you wrote dumb assembly, your CPU would actually dumbly do the instruction one by one. And if one of them was reading something in main memory and you need a hundred cycle to fetch it, it would just wait. Oh, I got it. And then do operation that did not depend on that and it could have done anyway. That was the last time we did that, 25 years ago. And since the Pentium, we have realized that it's just impossible. We can't just, we can't just take a PDP-11 and just up the megahertz until it's able to run super fast the, 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 the C code or the, or, the, or the assembly code we write sequentially. It doesn't do that anymore, and it's been 25 years. We execute out of order now. So it brings a question, right? If C is a low language, a low level language, close to the metal, optimizing it shouldn't change much, right? It's low level language, it's close to the machine, it's almost assembly, it's portable assembly as we usually t uh, say. So if I, if, I, if, I, if I do, for example, this, my, my, my great accumulate function again, and then I just do this, which just tells Clang, do not optimize this. Shouldn't matter that much, right? I'm not, I'm, I, I, I might have like some register allocation that are done that are not needed. Maybe like a bunch of uh, frame pointer and other debugging data, that, that kind of stuff. But how bad can it be really? Anyone wants to make a guess? An order of how badly or, or similar it can be? Like your, what? Like your 
Okay. You're not bad, 26. Yeah, so that's your super fast PDP 11 without optimization. 26, because it's actually, there is no optimizer behind the scene that is telling you, no, no, you're not, you're not, you're not building for a PDP 11 that goes super fast. You're building for a machine that goes out of order. So it really matters that you make this instruction first and then you start doing this instead. And it matters a lot that you do a bunch of other stuff. And also we have seen the instructions now that are able to, uh, to, 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 to vectorize uh, things. And you, you wrote a roll loop, right? You didn't write, oh, for this loop divided by four and call the special intrinsic every four one. No, you just, you just tell it, go through this loop. And then it, it guessed that it needed to use vector op operations. But even without vectors, right? Ve vector operation are gonna ma make, make it time forward performance, basically. Roughly, you, s you, you process uh, four uh, integers at a time with uh, like Cindy. Without it, it will still be like, uh, like six times slower. So there is more to that, right? It's not just, it's not just that. And, and that's the, oh, sorry, and the spoiler warning. So that's the best thing. When we are saying, you know what, I, I'm gonna do C because I'm close to the metal and it's gonna be fast. We're lying to ourselves. Like C is not a low level language anymore because, or maybe it is, but your CPU is not. I mean, your CPU is a complex machine and you cannot reason about it anymore. It's just too complex. You need someone to translate whatever you said, your uh, simple PDP 11 code to actually something that will be fast on an x86, because that's not the same thing. Uh, and so I actually went a bit more with that benchmark. Uh, I don't know if you can see from, uh, okay, so the left side is my, uh, my reference uh, thing from the, t from, 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 from the first slides, uh, which is, first one is row accumulate. It's my C accumulate with a for loop. The second one is start accumulate. Both of them are in OG, which is, uh, you tell GCC, optimize, the minimum possible to not interfere with debugging. Uh, the third one is uh, my grade C code that is close to the metal, unoptimized. It's basically an order of magnitude slower. And then to the right, there is my same C code optimized with O2, which as you can see is basically as fast as OG with my C++ code. And on the right hand side, you have O3, which actually on GCC is the first time you can actually use CMD. So it's four times faster because it's using a uh, vector instruction instead of doing them one by one. So yeah, by turning OJ, uh, which is the least minimum available uh, optimized setting on uh, GCC, you get a factor of basically an order of magnitude faster. And it doesn't matter if you wrote it in C++ or in C, you, uh, with O2, you get exactly the same performance. On my benchmark, that is dumb and accumulate integers. I'm not saying you should extrapolate all that, but I didn't have the time to benchmark all my game uh, with all those things. I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, so here is the thing. C++ abstraction or slower than C without any optimization. But both of them, or actually kind of super slow compared to what you would expect uh, if you disable optimization. Because optimizers are doing much more than just inlining your abstractions. They basically take your code and say, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever. I'm going to do this and I'm going to save you. So uh, even with the minimum amount of optimization, you have enormous gains. So asking for uh, a very fast non-optimized language is just madness today you will get less of a penalty uh, with C than C++ because usually there is less abstraction. But I'm, I haven't had the time to test the benchmark because I don't have the setting right there. I would need to run a, a quick bench on, uh, on Windows and I can't. But just by enabling inlining and compare my C and C++ code, I have a feeling that I would be very close in both of them without just optimizing, just telling him just fold those templates and just do whatever they do. Just, op just in line, do not optimize anything. Do not reorder instruction. Do not try to optimize registers. No, just, just, just in line. So actually, uh, vendors are, are trying to work on this. Uh, for example, on GCC, you have minus OJ, uh, which is optimized for debugging. On um, as you see, you have OB1, which you know it helps you, is your only hope. Sorry, I had to make that joke. Uh, it tells uh, the compiler, Optima uh, inline only something that is uh, really critical or that is stack force inline. Uh, basically means if it's a template, if it's an inline function, or if it has the force inline keyword, but it's not, and neither of those, and you think it's a good thing, inline it. Basically, it means the STL will go away. Most of it, all of your templates will go away. If you do O2, then it's gonna OB2, then it's gonna inline everything, even functions that are not supposed to be inline. But it just say, you know what, it's gonna be faster. I'm gonna inline it anyway. It's not perfect, 
the big problem uh, people have uh, is that it's also inlines your code and sometimes you just want it to inline the templates you're not actually trying to maintain at the moment. Uh, so obviously there is room for improvement. For example, Clang does not have any of this. There's a, a, a proposal, I think, for an OJ in Clang, but I don't think it has, it has been put anywhere. There is an O1 in Clang that Clang maintainers tell you to not use, and I can show you benchmarks to prove you, the, uh, to prove you that. Clang in O1 is broken by the old maintainer's word. It just doesn't work. Just use O2 or use OJ, They're, uh, or zero. There is, there's missing something in between. But don't try O1 with Clang. It's just slower than actual debug for some reason. Uh, yeah, know your build flags. Again, the build talk is hidden in this talk. Right, uh, so I hope I, um, I could have uh, I answered at least some of the criticism. I'm obviously biased because I have more of my career has been spent outside of video games and not in video games. So I kind of have a, a position that is not the usual one. But I, f I hope I have answered at least some of those concerns. Anyway, let's talk about containers a bit because we're talking about the STL. Let's see, like, I mean, another recrimination that is done about the STL is that uh, people think like I can do better than vector or I can do better than map. Let's see a bit. So uh, we're going to talk a bit about the most used containers, which are arrays, dynamic arrays, associative container, ordered and unordered. Uh, just a bit, because uh, I, had, I had the idea of putting like six over them, and then I realized I was already out of time, so I had to cut a bit. All right, so vector. We all know vector. We all like vector, right? It's the go-to container. If you don't want to think, you put a vector. If you want to think, but not too much, you also put a vector. It's great, it's cheap, it's cheap to move because you just copy a uh, move a pointer somewhere. It's cheap to random access because you just take a, you just make an addition on a, on a, on a pointer and, and you're done. And it's as fast as it gets to iterate over because since it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an array in memory, well, you get all the caching mechanism of modern CPUs. So boop, 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 you fetch everything uh, and every, all of your data is in cache all the time. And that makes a huge, a lot of a difference. You know this graph? It's from ITR two years ago, I think. It's a great graph. It uh, gives you an idea of uh, the difference between uh, some assembly instructions. Uh, let's, let's, let's just focus on the one that actually access memory. So the first one is taking a, ma a value from a register and putting it in another register. It's possible your CPU managed to do this in less than one cycle. I don't know how can it be less than one cycle, because, but it can be done. Like it might be able to do it. It can do several in parallel. Yeah, it can do that. It's very small. OK, let's see you try to read your data, but it's not in the register. It's in memory. But hopefully, you have huge caches. It's in L1. Great stuff. Three to four cycles. An eternity to compare to the normal one, but still three or four cycles, right? Like, I don't think you will have the time to make cog to use that as a, as a, as a pretext to go, to go on a coffee break. Like, that, that's not going to fly. L2, you start hitting 10 to 20 to 12. So you're almost an order of, you're an order of magnitude bigger than reading a register. And you're like, Two, 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 four times slower than uh, than, uh, than than reading in L1. If you have to go to L3, 30 to 70. If you have to go to main memory, then you make a coffee because it's like a hundred cycles. Like it's two order of magnitude slower than uh, than reading uh, from a cache, and uh, I don't know, like 50 times slower than reading from L1. Like it, it's forever. It's basically forever. So you don't want to do that. You want to read the cache. And how do cache line works? Well, they just every time you read an address, it just takes all the bytes that are around it because it's, it's fetched by lines. And then there is some math that makes sure that if you access the next bit, it's going to be another cache line. So basically, as long as they don't have the same modulo address uh, and the modulo is kind of big, you always have your data in cache because also your CPU is super smart. And it starts saying, hey, you have been reading all those bytes. I guess you're going to want the next one that I've not loaded yet. You know what? I'll do that while you're doing some computations. It is really trying to save you. So yeah, caching can have a 1 to 100 impact in performance. You can literally write benchmarks that are 100 times slower because they're, or they're, they're cache missing all the time. Uh, so actually, what does it mean? It means that big O can be, can, can, be, can, be, can be troublesome sometimes and lying to you, especially if you don't go to big size, very, very big sizes. Uh, like sometimes you have an, uh, you have a linear operation on a vector that it turns out to be faster than a, than a logarithmic operation on another one because the other one is completely scattered in memory. Uh, I think list, for example, start list. Iterate over vector to uh, compare to list. Okay, list is not supposed to be log anyway. Uh, think about a, bi a binary tree map. Well, we're gonna come back to that. A binary tree that is not cached. On worst case, you can be like 
you can be slower. And so yeah, the big thing is, you know what? If I have to brute force through a vector to find an element, it might be faster than going through a binary tree if it's not big enough. Again, depend on your CPU, how much the cache lines are, blah, 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 bench it. <coughs> but still, like if you are doing a lot of uh, memory, uh, sequential memory reads is great. Uh, if you have a set that happens to be read intensive, like you, you load it first, for example, it's a resource. You load it and then you just access it. You know what, put it in a vector and sort it, and then do a di uh, dichotomy search. It's probably gonna be faster than a lot of things you can think about. There might be some hash maps that are faster than this, but you're gonna beat a lot of things just by saying, eh, dichotomy on a vector, fast. Uh, if you have to uh, store references to a vector, remember that reallocation can happen when you push back, but index are not gonna change. So if you're only appending to a vector, uh, instead of keeping references of iterators, keep indexes, more stable. Well, okay, that's great. I've been, t I've, been, I've been talking about vector forever, I was like, but it might have some limitations, right? It can't be perfect. Nah, it's not. It's just great. I love it. <laughs> okay, let's be serious for a second. There are, I, I had to think a lot before putting slides there, but there are some things. Uh, the growth factor, which is something uh, people that are much smarter than me, especially when it comes to math and, uh, and series, uh, talk about. And there is this idea that uh, you should be close to the golden ratio when you decide how much you should grow. Uh, because for some relation to the Fibonacci uh, theory, and I'm not li 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 telling you this for, uh, it's true. Because of relation between the golden ratio and Fibonacci, somehow it's, it's better than two. I have no idea what it says, but uh, trust me on this, there are smart people that say it. Uh, problem is we haven't seen a great benchmark. Facebook, for example, on, this, on their re-implementation of Vector claim that they are faster than GCC because they use 1.5 instead of 2. They put a pull request on that to GCC, we replied we can't actually find any evidence that it's true. And that's where it started. So, maybe you have a strong preference, maybe you would like to be able to change it, you can't. The STL does not specify the growth factor, it's your implementer who decides and you can't change it. Unless you actually fought your STL, but please don't do that. Uh, but the actual true problem with vector is, by standard, you cannot do small buffer optimization. And remember, we're doing video games or um, other things that are very memory, uh, that are very performance and especially latency intensive. So we want to avoid heap allocation as much as we can because heap allocation is not predictable, right? Uh, if you're lucky, you just jump a pointer and you're like, oh, there's room, there it is. And if you're unlucky, it's like, oh, wait, there's no memory. Let me call the kernel and then take those files that are on the disk and then load them here and then write more files on the disk. And when all that is done, <laughs> here is your memory. <laughs> that was 10 seconds ago. No, <coughs> no, that's, that's not going to work. So, of course, you can say, well, you just should use allocators and all that stuff. There are great talks about allocators. This is not the talk. This is the talk about I want to do small buffer optimization on my vector, which means my vector, when I create it, should reserve some space for, I don't know, like 10, 20 elements. And if I actually go past that, then sure, okay, go to the heap, fine, have it your way. But most of the time I won't, and so I don't need it. For example, Clang, inside their own implementation, when they, when they compile your program, they use small buffers all the time because they realize, usually there is not that many ob objects in, the, in, the, in, those, in those arrays. There is just between zero and n, and n is on average like five. So by doing that, we save a lot of memory allocation and it's just much faster. Uh, but by standard, you cannot do it. And let's not talk about vector of bool. Let's just, let's just forget it exists. Well, actually, you have to remember it exists so that you know that you should not use it because it doesn't do what you think it does. It does worse. Uh, so let's, let's, let's just say, okay, let's, let's focus on the one thing that people we, we, we really care about, which is a small vec uh, 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 a stud vector with small buffer optimization. This is what we want. Uh, Boost has one, which is originally called small vector. Uh, Facebook is one called small vector. And Hapsel has one, but they hated the, the name, so it's called inline vector. But they all do the same thing, which is basically you have an extra template argument, uh, which tells how, much, how many elements you want uh, statically and, uh, and, and, and those elements will not take uh, heap allocation. Well, I mean, if you heap allocate a vector, but why would you new a vector? That, that's kind of weird. But if you have to, it will have to do it too. But if you're just putting a vector on the stack, done. Just moving a stack pointer and you have allocated, basically. So it's great because for small sizes, it's much faster, like literally much, much faster. Uh, of course, there is a small drawback, usually not that big because we're, we're talking small sizes, but since 
since you have a small buffer, it means you cannot move it anymore. You have to copy the data over, or you can start move the, the, the elements one by one, but possibly those elements are actually costly to move, or at least as costly as copying them. Like think, uh, for example, uh, a small buffer of ints is as, is as expensive to copy as it is to move because you just copy the value overs. You cannot just steal some guts to go faster. Usually not a problem, but if you do some weird thing, like you have a vector of buffers that are huge arrays, uh, you're going to see it. If you uh, actually know your size, you can use third array, which came in C++11 only. It has all the great stuff vector has, except it's guaranteed to be stack allocation or whatever. It's guaranteed to be allocated the way you actually create it. So if you knew it, of course, it's going to be the heap. But if you just put it on the stack, it's stack allocated. There is no, there is no heap allocation hidden behind the scenes. It's fast. It's awesome. But it's fixed size. It's not fixed capacity. And I don't know about you guys. But I really think that sucks. Because how many times have you said, you know what, I know there's not going to be more than 16 elements, but I'm not going to construct 16 elements right now. I'm going to have from 0 to 16 elements. And there is literally no way of doing that with an uh, with array unless you have like a special sentinel value that actually means that this is, uh, this is empty at this part. And then you have to start search for your vector inside your array to find it to see, oh, OK, I'm not full. I can push back another one. It's, it's just bad. It's just bad. It's like, uh, why are you doing this? Like, no, I want to dynamically insert, but I want fixed capacity that is on the stack. So of course, we go for alternatives. Fixed capacity vector, that sounds like a good name. Oh, Boost has one. It's called static vector. And EASTL, which is uh, Electronic Arts implementation of the STL for video games, has one. It's called fixed vector. Uh, Facebook has one, which is called small vector. And there is actually a proposed addition to the standard, which has been put forward by SG14 uh, couple years ago. I'm not sure where it is. It's, I think it's on its second or third revision. It's, it's going forward slowly, but, but it's going forward. And it's going to do exactly that. It's going to be a stud array with a capacity that does not construct the element. It just creates uh, a buffer of initialized memory, and it just constructs them in place and remembers what's the size. Um, the whip name is static vector. There has been a bunch of paper of people saying it's not a good idea. Uh, I know half road wire, for example, hates it because it feels like static vector sounds. What do you mean by static? I don't think static means on the stack. I don't know. Uh, it's just a name, right? Uh, we're bad at naming. We're programmers. OK, let's. Uh, Oh, yeah, I have to go much faster. Uh, we can gloss rapidly through the associative containers. Uh, you, know all, you all know map and set, the classic uh, associative container with a sorting. Uh, they're basically all trees, so everything is log n uh, when you go through, uh, through it. Uh, and it's great. You can insert stuff there, and the iterators remain valid, which is a big plus. Uh, and of course, blah, blah, it's a tree, so it's O1 to move. That, that's great. Uh, of course, the drawback is since it has to be sorted and have all those guarantees, it's always a red-black tree. There is basically not all many other ways you can do it. I mean, you can do other kinds of trees, but it's go basically going to be a tree. Uh, if you want to have the guarantees that uh, you're not uh, going to move everything, you're not going to uh, move some stuff in memory if you insert a new element. It, it has to be some kind of tree or, fl or linking by, uh, or, or by, by, by any kind, which means it's not cache-friendly at all. Because, I mean, if you, uh, if you allocate a map, at one point in your uh, application and don't do anything anymore, luckily, all your news are going to be of the same size. You can kind of trust your standard li library to put them all together, Luck if you're lucky. And so, yeah, if you go through it, you still have a chance of being through cache. But most maps actually live, right? You insert stuff, and then 10 minutes later, you remove stuff, and then an hour later, you had stuff, blah, blah, blah. And which means all your data is completely all around. So every time you say, oh, let's get me the next element, uh, because you're trying to explore the tree and find your element, you, you, you hit a cache miss, and you pay you that 100 cycle. That sucks. <laughs> also, lookup time is logarithmic and not constant, and I want performance. Logarithmic is not enough. I don't want it. Steel map and set suck. Don't use them. This guy told me. Right. Can we do better? Actually, no. Well, I mean. As long as we follow the standard, we can't. But maybe we can walk away around the standard, like, you know, pretend the section does not exist. And then maybe we can get better. For example, if we say, you know what, it doesn't have to be sorted. I don't care about sorted. I just want to be able to access it fast. Well, you get an ordered map and an ordered set. 
And by dropping the requirement on, uh, on the sorting, it doesn't have to be a tree anymore. And you can, uh, you can have a hash table with a list of buckets. And that's better. <laughs> and, you, and you have average constant time because it's a hash table. And basically, all you have to do is the hash, of hash something, make a modulo, and then boop, you, you find your element. Maybe you do like a couple comparison if there is conflicts. But yeah, peanuts compared to log and uh, exploration of, uh, of memory. But still, this guy is not happy. Oh no, he hates that thing. Because, you know, there's this thing when you do hash table that is called open addressing. Uh, when you guarantee that everything in your hash table is in one flat array, however you implement it. It's faster because it's one flat array. And as we said first, one flat array is the fastest you can go. Because everything is cached, blah, 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 is everything about cache today. So it sucks. Because actually, uh, the STL implementation on all platforms is doing the same thing. It's a list of buckets, and you know what's the problem with lists, right? It's a chain of pointers that can be anywhere in memory. So again, not cache friendly, sucks. Why would they do that? Right, so of course you can do better performance with uh, open addressing. There's a small problem. It's again, incompatible with the standard. And there are two good reasons for that, actually. And I think that's the reason why we uh, they, they specified uh, uh, an order map that way. The first one is, you have a huge uh, uh, space-time trade-off. When you do open, uh, open address hashing, uh, I don't have the time to do all the talk about hash tables. I don't know if you know about them. But the big idea is uh, your average load factor is much lower because collision are going to kill you much faster than they kill uh, a bucket list. So you don't want collision as much. So basically, you're wasting, I don't know, 50 70% more memory in empty elements just to make sure that doesn't happen. So it has a cost. It has a cost of at least 50% more memory. And by default, the standard says, nope, we cannot just be, let people assume that the hash table is going to be like 150% larger than what it should be, or twice. Even if you go at 50% load average, it means every time you allocate something, it's actually double the size of what you put in it. And maybe that's not acceptable, because people have memory constraints. Even us as video game have memory constraints. We don't have all the memory. Also, it invalidates references even when there is no rehashing because to make sure that their collisions are not too far away from each other, you might have to move stuff around when you're not rehashing. And again, that violates the standard. And that's very confusing for people because when you insert in a map that you know is super large and you're clearly not going to have to rehash, you kind of assume that your pointers to the other elements are still valid. And uh, open address would break that assumption and that would confuse a hell of a lot of people when they start learning C++. <laughs> so, but there is a more insidious thing that we don't talk about uh, much. But greatly for me, someone talked about it at, at C++ now and I could just steal his ideas. Uh, caching is not the, most, the, 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 the main reason why STL hash tables are slow. You can actually have a decent uh, performance with a hash table that follows the standard. And the reason is, you just have to not do modulo. Because I don't have the slides anymore because I had to cut it. But uh, if you want to take an ID, basically, the two high uh, thing are uh, libc++ lib lib and libstud++ implementation of, uh, of the standard library. Uh, the green one is uh, Microsoft's implementation of the library, which is done by Dinkumware. And the last one is the one that he presents in his talk that has a few more optimization to, be, to go a bit faster. But you see how much this small optimization from rewriting the whole STL gives him compared to just not doing what Clang and, and GCC do. And the big idea is they just use some clever math to not do a modulo because modulo is integer division. And integer division, we can have the smartest CPUs in the world. They're still super bad at integer division, like in the, in the idea of 50 to 70 cycles. That's 50 or 70 cycles that just stole your CPU because until that uh, modulo is done, you don't know which address you can load. So you can't even start triggering the cache memory load. So you're, you're basically done. And that's why you can go much faster just by replacing a modulo by some clever bin binary masks. Uh, this talk is great. I have the reference at the end. And I think it summarizes everything I have to say about hash maps much better than I do, because I actually did the research. <laughs> yeah, so basically, the, the takeaway you have is if you are only on MSVC, an ordered map is fine. Just make sure your hashing function isn't bad, but that's true for all hash tables. If your hash function is bad, you can have the best hash table in the world. It's still going to be terrible. Uh, if you have multi-platform needs, and a lot of people do that, and you're like, oh, yeah, but I can't just 
make sure it's fast on, on, on Windows and then go, go, go bananas when, I, when I'm, when I'm on, on Unix. That, that's just not acceptable. Well, you can use Boost and Ordered Map. We actually inspired uh, Stud, Ma uh, Stud and Ordered Map. It's the same API uh, with some extras, but Boost has chosen to use the same clever tricks as Microsoft, so you won't have to pay for the modulo. Or you can use uh, the guy who makes the talk, Maltes. Uh, I, I don't want to bear a butcher his name, but uh, he's made his own implementation and it's even faster than those. Right, so again, if you don't need reference stability, you can do more optimization. Uh, you might have heard of something called Robin Hood hashing. Uh, some people have made claim that this is the fastest hash table and if your hash table is not a Robin Hood table, then why are you even bothering? This is not a silver bullet. It comes with some constraints. Most of those papers have been written by people who don't really care about memory because to them it's just a number. And uh, when in certain discipline, that's not the case. Like my console has a fixed amount of RAM and depending on my hash table, I maybe not cannot afford to, ha to be double the size I expect it to be. <coughs> so again, check his talk, everything is there. I have the, the link at the, at the end. Now it's time to talk a bit much about you. Well, the STL and you. Because the biggest reason I wrote this talk is uh, a twist that basically looks like that. And that comes up about every six months. And I see some people nodding, so I guess you've seen one of those. It comes up just about every six months, like clockwork. There was one on Christmas, there was one this summer, there's probably going to be another one at some point. And it usually follows by your rant about all I have said, plus more. So here is the thing. The committee doesn't make that. Ah, let, let's go with, with the first uh, and, and most direct thing. Committee makes specifications, not implementation. If you can actually, say, if your first argument is, haha, uh, they're so bad I could just write a better one, well then just talk to your vendor. Because maybe your implementation is bad, but th it's not the standard fault that your implementation is an issue. It's not the standard fault that there's a modulo in, uh, in, in, in libs.c++, but not the maintainers of libs.c++. They just wrote a hash table specification and Microsoft actually managed to do a good job with it. Also remember, the committee is not making the language for one industry. No, I mean, I'm not even saying for you, I'm saying for one industry, whatever the industry is, right? There's a bunch of users all around and they all have different ideas. They all want performance, but they don't have the same trade-offs. Uh, video games wants uh, reasonable uh, worst case scenarios and they can spare some RAM, but not too much. Finance. Uh, frequent, high frequency trading version just wants the latest latency possible and the rest doesn't matter, they can pay. But as long as it's fast. Google and other uh, are going to be like, I don't care about RAM, it's not a problem, I don't even think there is a high enough uh, number that can exist before I get a bad alloc. You can just waste all the space in the time if, I, if, that, if, that, if, that, if that goes 5% faster, I'm fine. That's, that, yeah, we have a multitude, we have to, the, 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 the standard has to cater for all those peoples. So obviously it's going to pick defaults that are sane, but of course there's going to be some trade-off that are made that may not be the best one for your use cases. And I mean, I cannot stress that enough, but a, a rant on social media is not a good way to get a point across. Duh. <laughs> uh, so first of all, let's talk about burden of proof, right? Like, if you want to, before, uh, even if you're not going to tweet it, even if, if, if like, someone wants to make a, a claim that there is a problem with the STL, First thing to remember, you're not the only one to use the STL, right? My phone works because Clang works. Mm, this, my PC works because MSVC works, right? I have Windows, it kind of run. You might, you might say that it doesn't run perfectly, but I mean, it, it, it's compiled by Microsoft. They, in the, they eat their own dog food and like everyone in the world is using it. Like if there was a bug, there's chances are we would have found it. There might be some special performance uh, things that are wrong and that you can address or that you can offer better implementation. I'm not discussing that. But burden of proof, right? If, you're if, you go on, uh, if, if you start to go on a stage and say the STL sucks, it's made by a bunch of morons, like, uh, I mean, it's a hard claim to make. And you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe there is. Maybe there is a feature that is not good. Like, we, we've had bad... I mean, I don't know about you, but I've had trouble with a steel implementation in the past, and not only on Solaris, mostly on Solaris, but not only on Solaris. Uh, bugs happen, right? We're all programmers, and programmers make mistakes. It's okay, and sometimes they get past unit tests because it's a small case, or maybe there is a performance issue that they didn't see because they don't need real-time performance as much as you do, or something else. It's fine. And 
Maybe it's even fine to actually say, you know what, I'm not going to use DSTL for this. I'm going to use my own custom implementation because I have these constraints and they're not satisfied by all my vendors or they are satisfied, but also if I drop some of them, I could go faster. But you can have reasons. It's okay. But write a feature test that proves that your uh, thing works and that the STL breaks with your vendor. And then write a performance test that shows that you're faster. And then revisit it from time to time. Because it's like making a bug report and then ignoring the bug fixes. Saying, ah, no, no, I had made a bug report 10 years ago. This thing is broken. I'm never going to use it again. I'm going to spend all the money of my company maintaining another STL instead. Like, sure, it's fine. But then you have to rewrite the file system. And, and that's not fun. Trust me. Uh, we, we could not upgrade. And I had to rewrite half the STL for my uh, previous company in C++ 3. Like all the C++ 11 features. Because, you know, Developers don't care about that. They want to use whatever they see on these talks. And when you tell them, no, you can't use C++11, they're like, maybe I should find another company. So you try to make workarounds, and then you end up maintaining the STL in C++03 for Solaris. And that takes a lot of time. Uh, and, 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 and they had 300 pages every three years. Uh, you're not going to implement all of that by yourself. Uh, and most likely, you're still paying for the compiler anyway. So might as well use their work. So the idea is that STL has to be good enough. So it's going to make, uh, it cannot make unsafe assumption about references, memory overhead. It's going to have to be kind of conservative on some things. Can be crazy. Let's know. It's going to target the most common use case. If you have a specific case, you can beat it with a specific implementation. Of course you can. And I'm not saying you should not. If you have a good case against a uh, map or even vector, God forbid, and you have a good use case, you're better in every case for what you use, and you don't care about the extra benefits from vector, then yes, have a specific blah, blah, blah vector in your internal library and use it. Sure, fine, why not? But what you shouldn't do, in my opinion, is try to say, oh, no, 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 I've proven in that in those use case, it sucks, so never use vector, use my custom vector all the time. Because a fit-to-purpose alternative usually sucks as a default, because there's a reason why it's not the default. And this is the, there's a reason why the standard decided it's not the default. It's because it's going to trip people over in some cases. Remember the world of the night knuff. Uh, I will let that you read that so I, I can uh, drink in the meantime. Yeah, the, the big idea is that do not worry about efficiency in the wrong places at the wrong times, right? Like, you have a default that is OK, given by your compiler usually. Just use it. And then. If a provider tells you it's wrong, sure, use it. But like maybe don't make a super uh, fancy weird hash table with no uh, reference stability guarantee as your default, just because someone told you on the internet it's just faster. Because uh, you might, you might have surprises. Right, and if you want to engage with your peers, which is a good thing and you should do, do not do it by ranting on Twitter. I mean, I do it sometimes, but I don't expect a response or I don't expect things to change. And I know it's good for catharsis that you can just vent, but it's not making anything move, right? Uh, you might have a talk to it. Please don't go to a conference that is only for one specific industry and that hides all his talk behind a paywall. Because I don't know about you, but I will not see it. The rest of the committee, I'm not in the committee, oh, I just follow SG14 and 15. But what, uh, people in the committee are probably not going to see it. The people from other industry are not going to see it. And maybe they have a solution to your problem. Or maybe it's a 10-year-old problem. And they're going to be like, what? People are problem with that? Like, there is, or maybe it's actually something they did not consider and something important they should know about. They're not going to see it if you talk to only one specific industry and then nobody can access the talk unless he was there and paid a ticket to San Francisco or another super hype town. So basically, what I'm saying is make your voice heard where the rest of the C++ community is, right? So go to meetups, like here. Go to conferences, like this talk will be given to. Go to your study group. Uh, there's a bunch of them. You can just subscribe to the mailing list. <coughs> basically, we will get much more progress if we collaborate. That's, that's something that has been found in a lot of languages. Like since, since we have the internet, the magical source of everything, uh, we can collaborate much faster. For example, the standard committee, since I think two or three standard release now, has some tools that allow them to explore any C++ code ever made that is public and make decisions based on that. When they start thinking, maybe we can change that, we're like, oh, nope, there's like 10% of all the code base we can see that use it. And then maybe we say, nobody is using this pattern. 
or god damn a lot of people are using this pattern like you get something and the more data you have the bigger the sample the more representative the sample is well the better the assumption and the results you will make about it so don't be uh, afraid to talking to people that are not in your field about your problems maybe they'll laugh and say they solved it 10 years ago or maybe they're like oh i never thought about that like you never know so publish your findings Please, that's the thing, and that I think the thing that Mal, for example, in his talk uh, mentioned, and I will mention again. One of the reasons I think uh, we don't care enough about performance is that there is no performance standard. Like you know, the you know, you guys know the acid test, for example. Uh, if you ever done website, okay, it's time for a, a confession. I used to do web development when I was young. It was in C, okay, it was in C, right? I I, I didn't do JavaScript. I did a bit, but not much. Anyway, uh, the idea is, yeah, the ACID test. It's uh, it's just, uh, people were fed up with a uh, completely broken implementation of CSS, so they made a bench. It's kind of a benchmark in the sense that it had to render stuff correctly, uh, and and then you could test browsers and see how compliant they were. Compliance benchmarks, basically, and there is no such thing for C++. Like compilers have their own testing suite. And I heard that if you pay some companies very huge amount of money, they will tell you if, you, if, if they think your compiler is good enough or not. That's not what I'm asking. What I'm asking is like, if you have a benchmark that says the STL sucks in this case and I have a better implementation, publish that benchmark. Because I'm pretty sure people from Clang and uh, GCC and, my, and MSVC, this time they will not close your thing saying, not reproduced. I mean, we, they are developers like you and me, right? And I don't know, do you have Jira? What is your favorite button in Jira? Because mine is cannot reproduce. <laughs> Next to kick it. <laughs> Great, I'm going home. And I mean, I'm not saying that's what they said they do, but I mean, the temptation is there, right? Cannot reproduce. Who the fuck makes a bug report and doesn't give me a test case? <laughs> not gonna look at it. I mean, there's no difference there. We're still developers. If you don't give them a test case that proves that something is a problem, they're not gonna look at it. If we had performance benchmarks, for standard things, I guess we would see progress. I don't see why we won't. That, that's, I'm, I'm sure there would be some progress here and there because every year people would be like, hey, have you seen GCC got 5% this year? Like, you know, you could have a top three every year. Every time you give people a challenge, they just want to beat it, it's human. I'm pretty sure if I challenge some of you by saying, hey, who gets the best score as this uh, whatever, you see your programming contests work, right? Everybody loves those things. We use that at recruitment, it works. It should probably work too for the STL. There's no reason it wouldn't work, but we don't have those benchmarks. I mean, I had to, uh, when I wrote this talk, I looked for benchmarks. The best one I could find were from uh, Adobe, uh, which in the 2000s, when C++11 was close to release, made some uh, uh, compiler benchmarks that were basically taking the Stepanov test benchmark that he made in 98 to uh, validate how fast the compiler were at inlining the, or good the compiler was at inlining the STL and the iterators. They dusted it up, I did more tests, and then dumped them somewhere on the internet. And I did the exact same thing. I dusted it up, removed all the build, and put CMake instead, because that's what I do. And, uh, and then I put it on my GitHub. It's still a terrible benchmark, but it, at least it's a benchmark, and you can build it on any machine that has CMake support, which Evan Solaris has. And yeah, if you need packaging, like, you know, you're not the first one to send me uh, just an email saying, hey, here is my uh, 300 CMake list. What do you think about it? Like, I literally get emails like that or tweets. They, so I'm not going to I'm not going to be shy if I got another one. If the only problem you have with your benchmark is that it's a CMake issue or you cannot download boost, then ask me. I will help you. In conclusion, uh, the STL aims to be a good enough default as long as you put some optimization. but to be fair, that's true for all of C++ and most uh, and, and, and the C++ modern philosophy of today. You need a modicum of optimization. I'm not telling you put O3 and discard all the debugging symbols. No, but you need some of it. You may um, your vendors may have some limitation. Maybe something is in there. There is there is a paper from SG15 and 14 that uh, that, that, that is uh, that is in the in, in in the works where people are actually asking for that. Like trying to uh, see if the community can make something move forward so that we get some kind of, uh, again, not a benchmark, but a, a general idea of, can I have a debug optimized setting, please, that works on all platform or that gives similar results on all platform. GCC has a good one. Microsoft, you can get somewhere. Clang, uh, not so good. Specific case may warrant specific solution. Sure, the STL is not gonna solve all your cases. 
you can afford to waste more memory. You can afford to uh, not care about references. You can afford, you uh, really, really want small buffer optimization and you don't care that you break references on the move. Okay, sure, you can do better. You can even submit a paper about it if it's generic enough. But if it's not, yeah, sure, keep it. But also, like I said, take some notes somewhere on why you, you, you did that. Because, I mean, else you risk, like me, like I come in a company, like, no, we don't use the vector, we use our vectors that are basically exactly the same, except this thing. Why? Ah, because it was super slow uh, back then on Visual C++, blah, 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 and on this console that we ended up not actually supporting. Um, yeah, you know, historical reasons. There's, there's a, a lot of reasons why you, pay, you take a decision. You, it's very important that you remember why. You, I mean, it's not related to the STL in particular. When you make a, uh, t a technical decision for a practice in your company or you know, in your programming, remember why you did it. That's the most important part. Because if you don't have the why, then you're just perpetuating a ritual. Like it becomes a religion. It's not, it's not science anymore. Uh, finally, feedback is needed to improve the experience of all the C++ developers because we all have our own uh, user experience with the, with, with the thing and it might be good, it might be bad. Uh, people uh, will uh, literally riot if you tell them you, you remove their debuggers. I have seen people going all the way close to death threats just saying like, if the committee tries that, oh my god, I'm gonna fork the language or, or whatever or uh, it can go very ugly very fast. Uh, you know, we all have our things. You need to talk about it. You need to be able to have a, nash, a, a good discussion with the rest of your community about it because that's how we progress. And furthermore, I think your bill should be destroyed. Thank you very much. I'm going to put this slide at, every, at the end of every of my talks now. It's a Roman tactic. It worked. Do you see any Carthaginian now? No, it works. All right, serious talk now. Or well, at least your turn to talk. Questions? I talked a lot, so yeah. Out of curiosity, do you have any data on time spent in the game industry maintaining your own standard libraries? <laughs> but that's a okay, uh, can we shut the recording and... Uh <laughs> <laughs> right, so here is the thing. There is a lot of costs and there is all the costs you don't see. And that's the, probably the biggest ones because it takes X amount of time to uh, make a rewrite of some parts of DSTL. Then it takes much more to actually maintain it as the standard evolved because C++ comes around and then suddenly you need boost semantics and mplace and all that stuff. And then also it takes another one to add tests. But you know what? That was an extra so maybe you don't have it. And let's not give to get started about documentation. So uh, I would say a lot, but I'm not sure. I mean, I can't speak for others. Like at least, for example, Electronic Arts just publishes it. It's a public library. People contribute to it. It's become its own project. So there is value there. And I don't think it's money lost. Rewriting your own, uh, it has a very tremendous cost to maintain any, I mean, uh, do you have internal frameworks, right? How much do they cost to maintain every year and uh, update every time there is new things? With the STL, I would say it's even worse if you want to follow the standard, because then you have to update it every time the committee makes a decision, and maybe they'll make a breaking change, and then you're going to have a problem. They usually don't, but if you implemented your uh, strings with copy and write, for example, you might have a surprise at some point, like GCC had. On the other hand, if you decide to not follow the standard, and then you don't have to maintain it that way, you have another problem, which is people come to your company and they have no clue what you're doing because it's not what they heard everywhere else. Because sure, maybe they haven't heard of the STL, but there is basically 0% chance they have heard of your special fork that has another interface because it's only you that is using it. Did that answer a question? Yeah. Great. Someone else? So what about benchmark for EA still? Uh, Quick Bench does not support installing other frameworks and I didn't want to copy paste like 10,000 lines of libraries into one file just to be able to bench it. Uh, if you see Fred, before I do, you can ask him if there is a support in Quick Bench soon. Because I do all my uh, benchmark with Quick Bench, so that has some limitation as in I had to hack the egg out of it to be able to have all the different uh, debug levels in the same uh, translation unit. Lots of pragmas, don't do it. Uh, so... I don't know, I guess I should really get into having a small project that I can just drop in some Google Benchmark that just gives me a skeleton for Google Benchmark. It's just that
quick bench is so good for that and I really like what Fred did with it because I can just type my code, click run, and I get a nice graph that I can just screenshot and copy paste in my slides and I do that all the time. Uh, the limitation is I'm only restricted to the compiler he has and the library who are available. So no, I did not try ESTL and sorry if I took so long to answer the simple question. Yes? Um, you talked a lot about uh, Richter and MAP, etc. Yes. There are other containers, uh, String for instance. Maybe you don't use String a lot in games. Strings? Strings? Yeah, we do. We do. We have localization. We have text at the end of the day. We have interface. We have text. We have a lot of localization, for example. Yeah, but maybe <laughs> it's not uh, performance critical. But it would be interesting to see. To hear uh, from what I know about strings, uh, well, from what I know, for example, I had to fix an issue in our implementation of strings because uh, st uh, the, make the guy who makes strings are actually very smart. If you try to uh, to sum two strings and both for our L value reference, uh, R value reference, it's going to try to find which one is the biggest and take, steal the buffer from this one and then took everything because actually even if it has to copy everything over from the start and not just happen, it's going to be faster because you save the memory allocation. That's one of the optimization that you might not think about if you re-implement your own string and end up being slower like the one we had. Uh, uh, we, don't, we are usually not performance critical on, str uh, on strings uh, for a reason that you usually don't do lots, lots of string operation uh, in, a, in a loop, right? Usually what you do is that you update all your, uh, what we call the game state, like the, the state of the world in your game. You just run a huge update that moves entities left and right. You just like, you know, people die, army moves, all that stuff. And once it's done, you just render the result. And that usually is just whatever the user is looking at. You just generate a few string, description, maybe menus. So, uh, I, I don't think we have enough text and text concatenation in the world to actually uh, make that an issue. Actually, I think I did once, but that was a debug thing. Um, I, was, I, I, was, uh, I, I, was, I was allocating a lot of strings in a loop every frame. That was bad. I fixed it. But yeah, what I mean is usually string is not that as performance critical because we don't move a lot of, like most of the processing you do during the game, uh, like uh, during the core loop of the game is not strings. It's more like it's going to be floats and ins, basically. But yeah. you still have your own implementation. Uh, <laughs> can I, can, can we, um, we, we have a wrapper around stud string for historical reasons. I think to avoid the copy and write bug on GCC because they wanted the same behavior on all three platforms. Doesn't apply anymore because we have 6.6.11 ABI now, but for a long time we shipped for all the versions of, uh, of, of GCC that had the bug and we had to account for it. Yes? Yes, because uh, that talk is already way too long and allocators weren't their own talk. Uh, if you want to know about allocators, you have two options. If you have four hours, you can talk to John Lakos. If you only have one, uh, Andreas Weiss from BMW made a great talk at AQ and I think he's sending it again at over... I mean, he, he should definitely do it again because it's a great talk. It's all available online. It's introduction in tech talking about allocator in one hour and some video game company do. Uh, we don't as much. Uh, it depends on what you do. For example, a lot of video game companies, they work with levels, you know, or with zones or whatever. So you get into a zone, you do whatever you do, and once the zone, uh, when you're out of the zone, you can just trash everything that was uh, related to that. You know you're not going to come back to it. You don't even need to run the destructors. So usually there are special allocators that have no destructor. It's just an array on which you, puff, you, you push more data over time, and when that part is, is done, you just throw everything away, just forget that pointer exists, and, uh, and you start allocating again into it, because that's much faster. You don't have to, uh, to deallocate. My games are a simulation that, that just updates incrementally uh, over the whole lifespan of the game. So I don't really have that, except when I'm rendering, and rendering, if you've seen our games, is not the critical part. Hey, our game is beautiful, okay? It's just especially beautiful. <laughs> but fragmentation, we have uh, we have some, not too much, because actually we can pre-allocate a lot of the data sets. For example, we know uh, we know uh, in my case we know uh, the state of the world at the start, because we know there are that many provinces in the world, that many countries, and all that stuff. Other games that we do, like Crusader Kings, for example, uh, has characters that come and go that live and die and bo uh, are born. So we're clearly always adding some and I think they would benefit from it. I don't know if they're doing it. 
I haven't seen the code, so uh, I, I can't tell. It's all one of our oldest titles seen in production, so probably not, but I couldn't be sure. But there is there is some gain to be. No, allocators are a very interesting topic. You can gain a lot from them. Uh, you can offset, for example, a lot of the small buffer optimization just if you have a custom allocator for your vectors because then your heap allocation becomes super possibly super cheap. But it opens a lot, uh, it opens other issues. Uh, one of the big problems people have usually with uh, especially uh, standard uh, containers is that the allocators are kind of intrusive in terms of signatures and all that stuff. It's, they are not, uh, they are not hi hidden betw uh, between, uh, they're, they're, uh, what's the word? They're not hidden behind polymorphism, right? So they're part of the type. And that might make them cumbersome to use because every time you pass a vector to someone, you have, he has to know what kind of allocator he's using, so you have to end up with template code just because you have to work on a vector. Like if I call a function with a, with a vector, a reference to a vector saying, hey, do something about it, and he has, a, he has an allocator, well, I have to actually, he has to actually know the type of the allocator he's going to use when he actually writes his code. And when you're making business code, maybe you don't want to care about the type of allocator. You just say, hey, here's a vector, push some stuff. I think there's a paper to change that with the new allocators. Uh, I haven't looked at it. How do you use the TMR in uh, C++ 720? Yeah, I think Arthur O'Dwyer made a great talk about it. I already forgot what it does, but it looks promising. And that's one of the biggest reasons why people don't like allocators, the allocator model in the STL. That's not something I talked about it, but yeah, if you're big into allocators, they are kind of cumbersome to use uh, because of the fact that everything is statically typed and you might want some kind of uh, of hiding. Uh, I, I can't remember what's the name, uh, but yeah, you get what I mean. Uh, if you want the references, uh, the thing I, uh, the, the point I make for C and, uh, and, and, and the PDP 11 is uh, from a paper to the ACM that I re highly recommend, which is called C is not a high level language. That basically tells what I said, but in a much better manner. Uh, you can do better than or an ordered map. Everything I said with map and more. Uh, 50 Shades of Debug by this guy. Uh, it's, uh, it's basically why debug is not binary. Uh, I see at least four axes of debug and, and, and that's just a start. And I think I have another one. Yeah, uh, that's the accumulate benchmark uh, I used. Uh, y y when I share the slide, you will be able to, because I don't think you will remember that great string <laughs> for some reason. Thank you.